All right. Hey, welcome to Money Club Mondays. It's uh, March 25th, maybe 2024. So the year's flying by. we got a bunch of events coming up right now. A lot of fun stuff going on. And uh, today we have a special guest for you on Money Club Monday, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But just real fast, uh, I'm out in Tampa, Florida at a family mastermind right now. We got Easter weekend uh, next weekend or this coming weekend. Um, we're going to keep having a money club Monday, every Monday, even if we got events going on, uh, the, the, the quick start private money club, quick start with Noah, we'll keep going on every Thursday. So you guys keep hopping on these. We're going to keep putting out tons of valuable content, but we got some live events coming up also. So in a couple of weeks, uh, we have the experience, the BYOB experience mastermind in Orlando, Florida. I was just talking with Shauna. We do have a couple of tickets left for that. So if anybody does want to come out to Orlando, hang out with our team for a few days. That's April, coming up beginning of April in just a couple of weeks. So just shoot me an email if anybody's looking to do that. And then of course we have Private Money Club Money Tank coming up at the end of April. That's out in Salt Lake City, Utah and a stacked lineup at that event. Um, so make sure you get your ticket for that. If you can't make it in person, we do have a virtual option. So get your virtual ticket for Money Tank, uh, but much better if you can get out there in person and uh, meet with us live for a few days. We're gonna have some fun. And then in between both of those is uh, Noah Harris and Christy Duckett Harris, their re-up event. So they do an annual re-up event and um, it's always an awesome event too. I think they might have some tickets left for that. Uh, so that's in a couple of weeks in Columbia, South Carolina. If you want to come out, I'll be there. John will be there. Uh, actually, a bunch of people are going to be at the re-up also. So, so just a few live events, quick little things that are happening coming up. Uh, but with that being said, um, uh, John Blackburn is going to be the special guest host of Money Club Mondays today. So you guys are in for a special treat. I met John through Noah. Noah's going to be, or John's going to be a re-up with me. He's getting more involved with Private Money Club. So today's going to come on. And he's going to coach you guys. He's going to teach you guys on some different tips and tricks for real estate investing. Uh, some things that he's learned over the years. Very high level investor. So you guys are learning from the best of the best. That's all we bring on, as you know, onto our, our webinars. So really looking forward to this. Um, John, looking forward to meet you in person in a couple of weeks. I know we've talked Absolutely. several times on the phone, emails, things like that, but thanks for being on today and hosting this and uh, and have some fun with it, man. Absolutely. We'll have a blast. I'll take good care of everybody. Uh, hopefully everyone will walk away with some awesome learnings and uh, they can just dive right in and, and start adding the stuff into their business or into their investing uh, future as, as quickly as possible. So we'll we'll take good care of them. Absolutely, man. All right, cool, John. I'll talk to you soon, man. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Welcome to the call. Um, as Steven said, uh, my name is John Blackburn. Uh, I've been investing for a while, about 17, 18 years now. Um, super honored to to be on this call. I know, you know, it, it's hard to find a good community of people that, you know, are just here to all learn and grow together. Um, you know, some other communities uh, sometimes have uh, other motives, but, you know, I've, I've known Steven, I, I know Noah, obviously, uh, for a very, very long time. And when I was talking with Noah, he said, man, you know, I got to introduce you to Steven, you know, I've been coaching inside of his program for a while. And he's created this awesome culture, um, where everybody's just looking to help each other out. Um, there's opportunity for everyone to grow and make money together. So super excited to be here with you guys. Hopefully I'm going to do my absolute best to add as much value as humanly possible. So you guys can walk away, um, not only with some knowledge, but also some things that you can implement immediately inside of your investing, um, you know, day to day life. And whether it's buying rental properties or raising private money or lending private money, we can move forward with success. So what I want to do here quick is share my screen. Let me get this all pulled up here for you guys, and then we will get this process rolling. So the plan for the day is pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the process of teaching, and then I'm going to share with you guys after I've I've shared with you some and added some value, um, share with you kind of a deal. I know one of the things that you guys like to talk about on these Monday calls is kind of see deals available to be funded. So I'll show you guys how we present and share deals to all of our private money lenders. And then uh, from there, uh, we'll just kind of go through this process of uh, doing Q&A. So you guys can ask anything and everything you want. Feel free. Don't ever hold back any questions, regardless if you think it's on topic or not. Before we dive into the presentation, uh, in the chat, guys, I want you to drop, drop me a one if you're in this call looking to either become a private money lender or are currently a private money lender, just drop a one in there. All right. So quite a few. 
I love this. All right, keep it rolling. All right, we got private money lenders everywhere. I love it. All right, now drop a two in the same comment box if you're looking to become a borrower, right? So you're, you're not yet private money lender. You're a borrower. You want to borrow capital to do deals, maybe buy rental properties, do rehabs, whatever it might be. Just drop a two in there. Love it, guys. So we got a good mix of both. This is good. This is good. So I'm glad I decided to teach on what I'm going to teach on. So what I'm going to share with you guys today is really how I, as a investor, as well as a private money lender, I'm I'm kind of uh, in a unique situation, how I structure deals, all right? Not only for me to buy and renovate, but for me to present to a private money lender that I want to fund my deal, right? So, you know, Helen, I just saw you are a one and a two, right? You're an, you're, you're a borrower, but you're also a lender. So you're in the same situation, right? And there's always this fine line because as a borrower, we want everything as cheaply as possible. Um, you know, we want everything done as quickly as possible and we want as least amount of headaches as possible, right? So whereas on the other side, as a lender, you know, we want to have as many fail safes in place. We want all of our checks and balances done. We want to be as strict as we possibly can, right? So sometimes those things things don't really line up very well, right? So they're, they're counterintuitive to one another. So how do we strike a balance where, you know, the borrower, right? The, the rehabber or the, the rental purchaser, or this investor is super comfortable with the deal, feels like they're getting everything. But at the same time, the lender also feels super comfortable and feels like they're getting everything as well too, right? So we're going to work through that balance today. And I'll share with you guys how I structure those deals as both. So let me get my share screen shared here. Make sure you guys can see everything. All right. All right. As a private money lender myself, the best thing I always like to say is just because you can't get rich over money doesn't mean you can't make money in your sleep, guys. That all comes down to investing intelligently and smartly, right? As a private money lender, man, you know, we like making that 10, 12, 14% just over and over and over again without thinking about it as long as that money is secure, right, guys? So what we're going to chat about today, I covered it briefly here just a moment ago is the art of the deal, right? How can we structure a deal where everyone gets the best of both worlds, right? You know, the borrower feels super strong about the money they're getting and the lender feels super happy and secure about the deal that they're lending on. Security before and after the purchase. What as a private money lender do we have to demand and make sure that we get to make sure that our money is always secure. And then I'm going to show you guys a deal review. I'll show you how I present a deal. Um, it can be right in your wheelhouse. If you're wanting to borrow money, hey, here's a good structure for how you can present deals to investors. Or if you're a private money lender and maybe you're looking to improve your private money lending process, or maybe you've never private money lend before, but you want to set a structure in place of how borrowers present deals to you, you can steal this or you know take from it what you like. And then at the end, we're going to hit Q&A. So we're going to move fast and we're going to move heavy today. My goal is to get through this first section in about 30 minutes so that we give you guys at least 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the call to ask as many questions as possible so I can add as much value as forever. Uh, Lucas Z, uh, hello from CT. I invest in CT, Lucas. Nice to meet you, man. I am, uh, uh, my office is in Hamden, uh, which is in New Haven, Connecticut. So good to see you here, man. Let's keep rolling. So uh, a little bit about me, guys. Uh, I'm not a big fan of tooting my horn, but at the same time, I know you guys don't want to be listening to someone who's only done one real estate transaction in their lifetime, teaching you something about real estate transactions. So I've been in a game for a while, uh, about 20 years uh, at this point in time. I've completed over 1,700 deals. Um, I've raised over about $150 million in private money, whether that was for commercial purchases, you know, single family home renovations, multi-unit rental purchases. So um, done a few deals uh, under my belt. And, you know, this is again, not to brag. It's just to show that I've seen a lot of things. I certainly have not seen it all. It's why I love real estate so much because every day you wake up, there's a new adventure on the horizon, right? You know, what's what new thing are we going to learn about ourselves or about a deal today? And ultimately, that's why I do it, guys. But I have seen a few things, and the goal there is to impart that knowledge, those 20 years of knowledge, condense that as best as possible, and share that with you guys. You'll see the symbol down here, Good Life Properties. That is my uh, investment business. Uh, I own an investment company, and I also own an education company. My investment 
business is out of Connecticut and Arkansas. Those are the two markets that we focus on investing. Um, we do the entire state of Connecticut and we do just the Little Rock and surrounding areas of Little Rock, Arkansas. So give you guys some context, 5,000 foot overview of how I invest. Awesome. Let's keep this going. So guys, I'm going to need in that box, just so you know, I'm a super active trainer. I try to get people to participate as much as possible. So um, there are blank sides of a coin. How many sides of a coin are there, guys? How many? One, two, three, four. How many, si how many sides of a coin do we have? This is an age-old saying, right? So how many sides do we have? All right. Some say three. Some say two. Others say two. Awesome. One. All right. Walter, going big, going for broke, putting all his money on black. I love it. Many. Cheryl. All right. Right. General, but specific. I like it. I like it. Awesome. All right. So historically, right. If you Google this, what's it going to say? It's going to say two, right? There are two sides of the coin, but realistically there are three sides of the coin, right? We have one side, the other side, and then the edge, right? The edge, everybody always forgets about the edge, right? Now, you know, we say we use the same because, you know, well, one side of the coin is this, or like the grass is always greener, right? On the other side of the fence, yada, yada, yada. Well, when you've done both sides of a transaction, right? When you've been the borrower, you've also been the lender, we get this very unique opportunity to stand on the edge of the coin. And when we stand on the edge of the coin, it's super powerful. And the reason why is because we get to see both sides of the deal. We know what it's like to be a lender. We know what it's like to be a borrower. And that gives us this opportunity, this perspective, right? Life's all about perspective. The more perspective we have, the more intelligent we are, and the greater appreciation we have for the world around us. So if we have great perspective, we we can find and strike this this medium, if you will, this this kind of um, middle ground on how we want to go about and not only borrow money, but how we want to go out and lend money. And that's all about this entire presentation is how we can stand uh, on the edge of this coin, see both sides of the deal and get everyone right the best deal humanly possible. So for myself, I like to call this the art of the deal, right? This has no affiliation with the book uh, written by our late great president, Donald Trump, but I like the name, so I'm going to use it. The art of the deal, guys, um, the art of the deal is made up of four specific properties, right? The art of the deal is property specific, deal overview, loan terms, and supporting information, right? These are the four things that every deal needs to have. Number one, every borrower needs to have these things so that they can properly understand the deal that they're going to be doing, right? To make sure that, you know, even if they're asking money, right, they need to know confidently that the deal they're doing is going to be successful. And every but lender needs to have all four of these uh, pieces of information in order to make a quality, intelligent decision about the deal they're lending on, right? So both sides of the coin need to have these four specific properties inside of each and every deal. So this is what we call the art of the deal, guys. I'm going to go through this at a super high level. Let's do this. So property specifics, number one. What are property specifics? Keep this simple, guys. This is nice and easy. Whether you're borrowing money or you're you're lending money, right? We just need to know a few things, right? Number one, we need to know the address so that if we are a lender, we can do the uh, do some research on our own, right? We need to know the type of the property. Is it a multi-unit? Is it a single family home? Based on the type of property may vary how we like to lend on this home. And it could also really vary on the type of information we're looking for when we're doing our underwriting or our research. And last but not least, the quality of the neighborhood, right? Quality of neighborhood can greatly determine the outcome of this property, right? If this is an amazing neighborhood, right? A, B neighborhood, right? Properties sell like hotcakes, okay? You know, we're in a position, we're in a great neighborhood, we're going to do a retail flip as a private money lender. I know that this home is probably going to sell in three, four months, super quick, right? If this is a C or D level neighborhood, well, guess what? If my borrowers asking like say hey this property is going to be done in three months but it's a d level or c level neighborhood right i know that thing's not going to sell that quick right i know that that property is going to sit on that market for a while because it's looking for a unique buyer and a unique price point right so knowing the type of neighborhood that the property's in can give you some insight on if the other information that i'm being provided by the borrowers actually accurate all right so property specifics we keep it simple address type of property quality of neighborhood 
as I promise, guys, I will show you guys how I present this in each and every deal that I share with my private money lenders as well, too. Next up is deal overview, guys. So um, there's two slides for this, just so you know. The deal overview consists of multiple things, right? First and foremost, the purchase price. How much is the borrower buying the property for? The repairs, right? How much are the cost of the repairs going to be on this home or the estimate? Normally, when I'm looking at repairs from a borrower, I also like to see what I like to call contingency period, right? So, you know, let's say that the rehab costs $40,000, but they have a 10% contingency budget right? And that contingency budget is maybe 10%. So an additional $4,000. Now, you might think to yourself, well, John, why do I want this guy to have a contingency budget, right? I want him to be important enough and smart enough and experienced enough that he doesn't need contingencies. I don't care who the rehabber is. The rehabber tells you that he doesn't need a contingency or things don't ever go wrong, regardless of how long he's been doing a project. He's out of his damn mind. Excuse my French. Things go wrong all the time. I've been doing this for 18 years. I get a surprise at least. what well, might not be a big surprise, but I get a surprise on every renovation I do of some sort. And having that contingency is, uh, is super nice. Now, it might only be a $100 surprise, but it's a surprise nonetheless, right? So with rehabs, we can't guess everything that's going to happen. Um, closing costs and miscellaneous expenses. Usually what I file under miscellaneous expenses are going to be things like inspection fees, holding costs, um, you know, different things like that that would come up unique to each and every property. The current value of the home, right? We want to make sure that the money we're lending on this property is secure, not only when the home is done being renovated, but we want to make sure the money is secure the day we lend it. All right. So we want to know the current value of the home. And then we obviously the after repair value. Once this, once this nickel's all shined up, is it worth 10 cents? Right. We want to know those details, guys. Now, the second part of deal overview are going to be here. Estimated profit, right? What's the margin look like, guys? I don't want to spend four hundred thousand dollars to make ten grand. I want to spend four hundred thousand dollars to make sixty grand, right? So, what's our margin looking like? How long's our hold time, and is that realistic based on the type of neighborhood and the size of the project that we're doing? The closing date. When do when does this lender have to write this check? Right? Does he have to write this check next week, or does he have 30, 45 days to come up with that money? And then last but not least, as a lender and as a borrower, we need to know how this deal is being exited. Is it a retail flip? Or we're just going to fix it up and sell it to a retail buyer. Is it a burr? We're going to buy it, fix it up, and then refinance it out, right? Is it a longer term strategy, right? We're in this position where this um, you know, borrower says, hey, you know, I want to borrow your money, but instead of for three or four months, I want to borrow it for a couple of years at 12%, which is one of my favorite things I've been doing lately, guys. If you're a borrower or if you're a lender, guys, start talking to the opposite, right? Stop talking, start talking to your lender or start talking to your borrower about potentially doing longer term loans, right? If I want to go out and get a commercial mortgage today, all right, and I want to walk out this door, get down to my local commercial lender, I'm going to get somewhere between 8 to 12%, right? That's just how it works, right? That's where interest rates are today, right? Now, historically, with a private money lender, I'd pay them 12%, 10 to 12% all day long for one of my rehabs, right? Which they're in and out in maybe four or five months, something like that. Why, why not as a lender, you just lock your money up at 10 to 12% and first lien position back to 100% by real estate as well as insured for three years for 10 to 12% too, right? Which is not much higher than what you could get at a bank. Right. And the purpose of doing this is if I can get a rental property to cash flow today and I can, you know, look like a hero to my private money lender and pay him 10 to 12% for the next three years. And then in three years, those interest rates go from eight back down to four. Right now, we're in a situation where, heck, I can refinance, I can give a boatload of interest back to my private money lender, as well as now I'm in a super good cash flowing state. I've saved money on refinance costs instead of needing to refinance two or three times over the course of those several years. So guys, um, watch the market in comparison to what you can borrow or lend as a private or hard money lender. And that's going to allow you to adjust the types of loans you're offering or the types of loans you're asking for and just be more successful, right? Adding exit strategies every day to the business that we're doing. Awesome, guys. 
Um, any questions so far? I'll keep rolling, but as you guys come up with questions, just drop them in that webinar chat. The reason why is because that's going to allow me to go back and look at all these questions so I can do a really good Q&A for you guys. All right, so just drop that stuff in there um, as we go along. And if I see something that's super pertinent to what we're talking about, then we'll jump in and uh, uh, I'll answer that question right away for you. All right, let's keep this rolling. So what are we talked about? Well, we've talked about the deal overview, right? We've talked about the property now, the loan terms, right? Personally, as a borrower or as a lender, what I like to see from my borrowers is I like to see them come to the table, right? One thing that really drives me crazy is when a borrower shows up and is like, yeah, what do you give me, right? Like, what are your terms? Like, as a lender, I want a borrower to comes up that knows his numbers, right? Here is my exact lending criteria. Here's what I borrow at. Here's how the deal works. I want them to share that with me. Now, does that mean that I need to agree to it? Does that mean those terms are not negotiable? Absolutely not. Everything's negotiable in the world of real estate. But what this gives me the opportunity to do is at least know that this guy has done his numbers. He is confident in the deal that he's putting together. So for loan terms, what I'm looking for are these. I'm looking for the lien position, right? For most lenders, we want to be in first lien position. If we're willing to take second lien position, we're going to be uh, expecting a lot higher of an interest rate or return on our investment. Lost payee, right? If you're in first lien position, you need to be the first lost payee on the insurance policy. So if the house burns down, you get your you get the check from the insurance company first before anyone else gets paid out. Um, is that borrower offering you a personal guarantee, right? Or is it just um, a guarantee by the LLC that's borrowing the money? Personally, I offer personal guarantees to all of my borrower or all of my le lenders because one, it makes them feel way more comfortable. And two, I'm really confident in the deals that I do. So adding that, that little extra layer of protection for my lenders is simple. Um, interest rate, right? Are you paying simple interest? Are you paying monthly? Are you paying um, at the end of the year, right? What type of interest rate are you providing? And are you willing to take any points per deal that you run? All right. And oh, when is the interest being paid? Is the interest being paid monthly or is the interest being paid when the property is sold or refinanced? So these are some good starting points for loan terms. Now, once the loan terms are stated, right? Once we've seen all these deals, like I've presented everything to you, right? As a borrower, right? However, unless we have a long, long history of, you know, lending and borrowing from one another and a long, long history of success, right? Then I, as the borrower, or as the, the lender, I want to see proof, right? Great. All these numbers look great. Everything sounds great. Everything looks correct. Um, this is a deal that I potentially would lend on. However, I don't believe you. And I say that with the kindest words possible, right? And the, with the best intentions. How, how do I know all of this information is true, right? Well, you're going to supply supporting information with each and every claim that you've made in the presentation you've given on this property. All right. First off is photos. As a lender, I want to see the property, right? What's this thing look like? All right. How's it, uh, you know, what's the current shape of this home? Does it really look like it needs $100,000 of work or could you get through with the $50,000 that you're actually quoting in your deal? All right. What's the repair estimator, right? Do all, does all the stuff that appears to be broken in the photos, does that show up on your repair estimator, right? I want to see, you said the property's worth $350,000 once it's done. Prove it, right? What are some sales that show that, right? If I'm lending on this property today, I don't want to lend you 200 grand and the home only be worth 150 today, right? Because at that point, the only way my money's secure is that if you 100% guarantee that you're going to get that renovation project complete, right? I want to lend on a property that's worth the same amount that I'm lending at right now as it sits today. And I only want things to improve as the project increases. All right. I want to see what this thing looks like on Zillow. Not because I really have any desire to see what this estimate is, but Zillow tells me a lot. It can tell me the last time the property sold, how much it sold for, what are the actual taxes, or a lot of the information that you're presenting to me accurate. And then last but not least, Google Earth. Why Google Earth? We talked a lot about neighborhood type, right? 
I'm going to walk around the neighborhood. I'm gonna, as a lender, I'm going to be like, man, is this a nice neighborhood? Do I see other rehab properties? Is this a place that I would like to live if this is going to be a retail sale, right? Just having all these conversations, these questions with myself as I'm verifying the information that a borrower is presenting it to me, in, right? Now, obviously, as a new lender, it's going to take some time to get acclimated to this process. It's going to take some time to you know, um, feel comfortable with underwriting a deal. However, if a borrower shows up to your first, you know, lending or second lending excursion rights or, or investments, and he shows up with all of this information, right? Laid out super nicely, looks super clean. It's understandable, it's logical, it's linear. Then that's going to give you so much more confidence in lending to that individual. And if you're borrowing guys, if you're going out looking for money, just present it, right? We're not we're not trying to hide anything. Usually in a lending situation, the more information, the better. There's a reason why when you go apply for a loan at Chase or Wells Fargo, they ask you 97,000 questions, right? The more information, the stronger the bank feels about the deal, right? So the more information we're giving our lender up front, the more confident he is to pull the trigger and close on that deal when you need them, need them the most. All right, guys? So that's supporting information. Now, your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. This is really specific to lenders, right? Um, security before the closing and security after the closing. So what do we need to understand like far none, non-negotiable things we need to know to maximize our security before we wire the money to the title company or the insurance company. And then after closing, what are the things that we need to know or have in place in order to secure our position as the project moves forward? All right. Number one is first lien position. All right. We want to be in first lien position on the property as the lender if we can, right? Sometimes there are a lot of borrowers out there that are willing or sorry, lenders that are willing to do second lien position, but that's because they're getting paid a stupid amount of interest. And if you're willing to take that risk, guys, go for it, right? The interest rates that you can earn and second lien position are great, but for maximum security, it's first lien position. You're listed as the first loss payee on the homeowner's insurance policy, lender's title insurance policy. Now guys, this is, this is, if this is a golden nugget, if you wanted a golden nugget out of this and you are a lender or you are a borrower, this is the golden nugget. So everyone's heard about title insurance, right? Normally the seller or sorry, the buyer is getting title insurance against any type of errors that have been made on the title through the transaction or the purchase, all right? There's also what's called lender's title insurance, an additional title policy, right? That I personally, as the borrower, pay for every single one of my lenders because traditionally the title policy for the buyer just covers the buyer, right? It doesn't cover the lender, right? So essentially in a, in, in a very unique situation, the title policy could show up, get the buyer out of a jam with really bad title, or title issues, but leave the lender hanging and still having the lender have money lent out on this property, but not being able to take possession of that property at some point in the future. So making sure that you as a borrower or you as a lender are getting a lender's title insurance on each and every pro project you lend on is massive, guys. It's just a few hundred bucks, like I think $300, $250, just adding that next level of security long-term for yourself. All right. Next up, guys, recorded mortgage, right? You can have a mortgage on a home, but if that thing is just sitting in somebody's office desk, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So we want to make sure that when we are in first lien position, that mortgage gets recorded, right? It is on record that we are legit the lender. What's up, Noah? Thank you. Thank you very much, my man. Love seeing your training as well, too. And a personal guarantee. I talked about this a little bit earlier, right? It can be in a situation where, you know, a lot of people are scared about offering a personal guarantee. For me personally, I like it because it sets me apart, right? I'm happy putting, you know, my cash, 
my house, my cars on the line, right? Because one, it gives you as the lender, all the warm and fuzzies, man, this guy's legit. He feels good about it. I feel extra secure. But number two, I feel confident in all my deals. So when I hand that personal guarantee over to you, that's just how confident I am. And I'm going to get that deal done, turn a profit for both of us. And last but not least is when the property closes, you wire the money, boom, you want that HUD or that settlement statement in your inbox from the attorney or the title company, because I want to see where my money went that I wired you, right? How much went to closing costs? How much went to the seller? How much went to the borrower for repair costs, right? I want to see all of that line itemed out. So that'll give you a really good idea of where all your money was sent. Now, after closing, right after that money's been wired, there's a few things that you can put in place as the lender to further secure your overall investment. Now, not all lenders do this. Um, I'm kind of up in the air with my lenders on who I do this with and who I don't. If I have a really long standing relationship with my lenders, this, these things usually don't um, don't apply. But if this is the first time you're lending to someone, you've never done business before, I really highly recommend that you do these things. Number one, repair and work inspections, right? Let's say you fund somebody's deal and you're doing what's called a repair or draw hold back. So the repair budget's 40 grand, you're funding all 40 grand, but you're not giving the borrower that $40,000 up front. You're giving that $40,000 as repairs take place. So let's say draw one is requested. They did $15,000 of work. They told you that they did X, Y, and Z on the property and the contractor needs paid. That's why they need that $15,000 worth of work. Well, you can take it for granted. You know, you can believe them on face value, or you can have a quick inspection done. Cost you a hundred, 150 bucks to have somebody go out to the house review all the things that they stated that they had completed. And that inspector can report back saying, all that work's done, wire that 15 grand, or maybe something different happened. Maybe not all that work got done, or there were some issues, or, you know, it's just, we're, we're doing what I like to call inspecting what we expect. Now, usually at some point, you'll get to a relationship with a borrower where you don't need to do these inspections. You know, you can just have that borrower maybe take pictures, or you just trust them enough that, you know, you'll just send them the whole repair budget up front, which is like where I'm at with a lot of my lenders at this point in time. Um, repair and repair cost draws, which we just talked about, right? The repair cost draws and the work inspections kind of go hand in hand, right? Every time you want to, uh, to get a draw for more repairs or more money, then inspection gets done. And then last but not least, consistent communication. I try to email, I have a, uh, a teammate in my office that emails all of my lenders twice a week with updates on the properties that they're lending on, Right. Whether, you know, where we are in construction, where we are in removing a resident, where we are in, you know, the listing and the sale of the property, where we are in closing, just gives them warm and fuzzies, right? You know, they just gave me 300 grants, right? You know, and as much as they trust me and as much as they have faith that I'm going to get the job done, man, hearing from me every now and then just adds a whole nother level of communication. So if you're a borrower, guys, commis consistent communication is awesome. And let me say this, if the project is not going the way you want it to go and you're getting your butt in a little bit of hard, hot water, even more important to have great consistent communication because there's no problem that cannot be solved without good communication. All right. Don't run and hide from the problem, face it and move forward with your lender. Two minds are way better than one when it comes to solving a problem. Awesome guys. Now, that's kind of my presentation I wanted to go through on as a borrower or as a lender, what you should set up or what you want to look for. Now I'm going to go through a deal review. I'm going to show you how I present a deal, guys. It's going to look super familiar from what I just went over, but it's like a real life active investment for you. So you can see that. Um, if you guys have any questions, jump in here. Where are these terms listed, Thomas? Where are these terms listed if you are a lender? I'll show you how I share mine, Thomas. Um, that's a great segue. It's super upfront. It's super apparent. And I will show you guys exactly what that looks like if you were to ever be a lender for me, how you see a deal presented to you. Who pays for lender's title insurance? Joanne, I always, as the borrower, pay for my lender's title insurance. I pay for all my lender stuff. The only thing I don't pay for my lender is the wiring fee for them to wire me money. 
Um, I pay for title insurance. If an attorney needs to do any contract work, I pay for that. I pay for everything. Just that's the cost of doing business. That's the cost of borrowing money. Uh, do you provide references of other lenders you've worked with if asked? Leah, great question. Um, I have in the past. Absolutely. Um, I have no problem doing that. Um, you know, there will be this situation where you're working with someone who's, you know, it's their first deal, right? And, you know, if the margins are big enough, I always encourage people to take a chance on someone who has, who's doing their first deal. And the reason why I say it is because, you know, I was in that position once, right? I was that person, you know, going around instead of offering a lending opportunity, I was begging for money, right? Those are very two different things uh, to get my first deal done, you know, 17, 18 years ago. Um, so the margins are big enough. Uh, you, you might not have references for that type of individual, which is okay. You just kind of need to use your best character judgment. And maybe you're not working with, uh, maybe you're not getting references from a lender, but you're getting a lot of references from family or friends or coworkers or something, you can always ask for references. They just don't have to be lender references. Awesome. Cool. So let's keep this party going guys. So here's the deal review brought to you by yours truly, John. So this is a property, good life properties locked up um, last week. Uh, actually it was two weeks ago. We just had the inspection done. Um, we had to go back in for a price drop on this property because um, the repairs were much larger than what we thought. I mean, they weren't, weren't a huge, about $10,000 more than we thought. Basically the, it's a rental property and the seller had presented it to us as, you know, in good shape. But we found out when we went to the property that the seller who the owner of the property hadn't been in it in like seven or eight years. Right. So, uh, he had no idea that there was no basically ceiling on the first floor any longer, um, the main stack going into the sewer was leaking and cracked. Um, the furnace was, you know, five seconds from stopping working. So we're happy that winter's over in Connecticut. So uh, obviously that added a lot of lot to our bottom line in terms of our budget. But I'll go over the specifics with you. So 86 Bristol Street in Southington, Connecticut. Uh, it's a single family home in a B-class neighborhood. Now, these types of neighborhoods, anything about $350,000 or less in Connecticut is bread and butter. That's the average property price. So staying below the average property price that gives you the highest pool of buyers possible for retail flip. All right, guys. So this is the property we're looking at. This is how I would present this to one of my lenders. So deal overview, guys. You've seen it before. Whoop. Let's talk about it. Purchase price, $200,000. That is down from our original contract price at $250,000. So we brought that down by about $15,000 because of the increase in our repair budget, which is like 10 or $12,000. Repairs are 50 grand. Our original repair budget was $38,000 and that got kicked up to 50 grand because of those extra expenses. Closing costs and miscellaneous expenses. So what's the $17,000? I personally, and I've had this conversation with every single one of my private money lenders is they want to put as much money to work as possible. As long as that money is secure, they want to get as much of their money working as possible so that they have the ability to get the highest return on their investment. So what I do is I finance my closing costs, my holding costs uh, into every single deal that I do just to get more of my money working for my lenders. So Essentially, $200,000 for the purchase, $50,000 for the repairs, $17,000 for all of those other costs, total loan amount, $267,000. Now, that number is pretty arbitrary, right? Great, $267,000. How much is the house worth today? How much will the house be worth in a couple months when the repairs are done? Give me some meat, right? So let's talk about that meat. All right, current value of the home is $275,000. So if you lend on the property today, $267,000, the home is worth what you're lending on it. Now, remember, you're lending the full purchase, the full renovation, plus all of the other expenses and holding costs. And the property value is still above all of those numbers, right? So think about the security of your investment there, okay? Next is what's my after repair value? Well, once everything's all said and done and the property's fully renovated, we're going to be about $330,000 in ARB. My guess is, is this property will sell for about three fifty. dollars 
Um, but we keep everything super conservative. I always, 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 always bring my properties to market at below market value. The reason why is because that gets people really excited. And when people get really excited about a home they're going to live in, not an investment property, but when people get really excited about a home they're going to live in, especially you ladies, guess what? Oh, the cost of money just goes out the window. So if I can bring a property ten dollars to $15,000 below market value to market, people are like, oh my God, why is this such a great deal? Why is it in such good condition? We have to have this thing. And then a bidding war begins. And we just ride that wave the whole way to $350,000. Um, I did the same thing with a property I'm closing on a Wednesday. We brought it to market at 275, which is almost 25 grand under market. I rode that wave to $332,000 sale price. So love that method, guys. Um, just another way to get the biggest bang for your buck. Let's keep rolling, guys. Estimated profit, $44,000. We have a profit percentage man, a, a minimum inside of our business, uh, 15%. So we do not take on a renovation project unless we're getting 15% or more. I think this project works out to like, and this is with our uh, rehab contingency in the deal. This is with the lower after repair value, right? Um, we're at like 15.6%, right? So super strong numbers across the board. Our estimated hold time soup to nuts is going to be four months, guys. So that's a deal overview. Closing date, 5-7, that's May 7th, right? That's because there's a resident in there and we're removing the resident. So May 7th is when we're closing. And then what's our exit strategy? We're going to perform a full renovation and then list it for retail sale. And I'm going to stop there and answer a couple of questions that came in. Why is your purchase price is not the current value? Uh, Helen, that's because we are really good at negotiating property prices, right? Current value is $275,000. Purchase price is two hundred grand, right? We bought the home for $275,000 and we put $30,000 into it. And, you know, all the other expenses that go along with purchasing and selling the house, guess what? We are not going to be able to sell that thing for a, a a profit, right? You always need to get that home for as deep of a discount as humanly possible. All right. Leah, no dumb questions, right? Feels like a borrower has no skin in the deal if financing 100% of the purchase price plus goes and cost plus reno. How do you make the lender comfortable with this? Um, Leah, that's going to be a lender specific, really feeling, if you will, uh, and decision that you guys need to make financially for yourself, right? You know, what I do is I always show that, hey, coming into this deal, the property is worth at least, if not more than what you're lending on it right out of the gate. Your whole value of what you're lending on it is uh, more than what the home is worth as it sits there today. So to give you at least 100% protection in the money that you're lending. Beyond that, right? You know, you can lend less money, you're going to earn less of a return, right? You are protecting your your position. And, you know, for some borrowers, that might work perfectly well. Like maybe you don't want to lend on your closing costs and miscellaneous expenses. You know, we can cut that $17,000 out. You're good with purchase price and repairs. It's all a negotiation, right, Leah? So feel free to negotiate with any of your lenders to the point that you feel comfortable with the deal, right? Know that you'll lose some opportunity because of that fact. But at the end of the day, if you can lay your head down at night and sleep well, go for it. Don't stress yourself out over the investment you're making. All right. I always tell my investors, I said, hey, any investment that you're uncomfortable with, regardless of how big the margins are, is never worth it. Because you know, you're never going to sleep well at night. If anything ever small happens, even though how, no matter how insignificant that thing is, right? It's still going to freak you out beyond belief, right? So just always make investments as lenders, as investors, right? That you're comfortable with, that you can sleep with at night, right? No amount of money is worth the uncertainty that comes with all that stress. All right. So let's keep this going, guys. I'll come back and answer questions. I just want to get through the rest of this for you so you can see what this looks like. Loan terms. Boom. As I said, I come to the table. Again, everything's negotiable. Right. But this is my baseline of loan terms that I present to all of my investors. Loan amount $267,000. You'll be in personally in position. You'll be first loss pay on the insurance policy. You'll be a personal guarantee and you'll get 12% annual simple interest, interest paid at time of sale. Now, with some of my borrowers, we have different, different terms, right? Like one of my lenders, 
this is her retirement. She's 80 years old. She lives off the interest, right? That's her income every month. So I pay her interest on a monthly basis, right? And as lenders, guys, just so you know, they're like, I want my interest month to month. You also need to look at that from a business standpoint as well for who's borrowing that money, right? You know, the more cash flow that comes out of a business on a month to month basis, the harder it is to operate that business in the black and to be successful. So be cognizant of that, right? If you don't need the monthly interest payments, right? And the margins in the deal are big and you feel comfortable with it, then don't ask for it, right? All you're doing is hindering business cash flow, which can be very difficult for the borrower. And the last thing you want to do is make it harder on our borrower to pay us back long term. All right. 12% simple interest, right? This is pretty standard. Again, we can negotiate. It can go down, it can go up, it can go sideways, right? All of these things are negotiating, but this is what I bring to the table for my lenders initially. And as a lender, what I want to see my borrower bring to the table to get things started. And then last but not least, I told you all this fun stuff. Is any of it true? Maybe, maybe not, right? The only way we can true prove that is if you get supporting information, right? Photos, repair estimator, after repair value, comparable sales, as is comparable sales, Zillow and Google Earth. Now I'm gonna pop off of this. I'm gonna go to my Internet Explorer or my uh, browser, Internet Explorer. How old am I? Did I just date myself with Internet Explorer? I think I did. Forgive me. We're gonna go to Google like the rest of 2024 and we're going to start looking at um, some of the supporting information for you guys. So keep those questions coming. Deontay is very nice, man. Appreciate it, dude. I've done it a few times. Uh, ever do an interest reserve? Uh, Mike, you mean for as a lender wanting interest reserve for my borrower? I never personally have, but man, it's a beautiful thing about real estate. Everything's a freaking negotiation, right? So you can certainly do that. Let me stop sharing my screen. So somebody asked me, John, how does this, how do you get this? How does this like come to you as a borrower, right? Or as a, as a lender. If I mix up lender and borrower one more time, we're going to have issues. Um, so this is what it shows up, guys. So whenever I get a deal and I have a list of lenders that I've worked with for the last 15 years, right? They all know me. They all trust me. So, you know, I don't have to go too crazy in terms of like fireworks and, you know, confetti and stuff like that. Whenever a deal comes across the board, it comes just like this, right? Here's the deal. Everything we just talked about, right? Everything that we just talked about this is exactly how the deal gets laid out. One was just in PowerPoint form. This is an email, right? What's the saying? Every meeting could be an email. Well, here you go. All right. So here's how the deal's laid out, right? We have our property address. We have our deal overview, right? We have our loan terms, you know, our closing date and exit strategy. And then this is all of our supporting information down here, guys, right? All laid out, all nice so that a lender can come in here, you know, review it. One, make sure it fits their lending criteria, make sure it fits all their underwriting criteria. And then if they have questions or they want to negotiate terms, now they can reach out to me. They're fully educated on the deal. They shouldn't have too many more questions and we can have a super legit conversation about it, right? And then, you know, like we're just, I'm gonna open up all these links for you real quick so we can pop through them quick, right? We start at photos, boom, full walkthrough. See what I was talking about, right? There's no ceiling in the first floor. I don't know how the owner of the property didn't know about that anymore. Just so you know, that's old knob and tube wire and they don't use that anymore. Um, but as you can see, guys, all the photos, the renovation, do, do those photos match up with my repair estimator and everything that we've talked about, you scroll down to the bottom, right? Before our contingency period, after our contingency period. Okay, cool. So photos match up with our repair estimator. How about our after repair value? All right. 339. Wow. Remember I said I was super conservative. I am super conservative, right? 339. I actually had an extra... A uh, few comparables in here. We can pull this bad boy up to 349, 350, right? This is where I think we're going to land whenever we sell this house, right? But we're going to list it at 330. All of our numbers were run at 330, all right? As is 275, right? You can come down. You can see the photos and the condition of this property, the size, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage for the as is comparable values, and then obviously, if we want to take a stroll down the neighborhood, right? Is this some place that someone would buy? We got a corner lot. The Google car was obviously moving. 
when I took a photo of this house. Uh, the roof is in way better condition than that, obviously. But man, I don't know. Did I just did that just load horribly? Ah, there we go. Now we're cooking. All right, this is this is it right here, corner lot. Nice little home. Exterior of the home looks awesome, right? The exterior of the home's in great shape. The interior of the home's where our struggle is. So there it is, guys. Super straightforward, super simple. One-stop shop for all the information that you need as a lender and borrowers take heed. This is how you're going to want to present the deal, guys. Awesome. Um, that's it, guys. That's all I have. We got like five minutes left. So I would love, love, love to take any more questions that you guys have, answer anything that you have for me. And what I'm also going to do, guys, if you have any desire as a borrower to, you know, get this template, um, I'm happy to email this template to you guys through my email so you guys can check that out. And then also if you're a lender and you have any desire to potentially become a lender for our team uh, and our company, uh, I'm happy to chat with you about that as well too. I'm going to drop my email in here along with my cell phone. Feel free to either email me or text me guys and we can chat more about this deal or another deal or I can send over this uh uh, email template for you guys. So you can use it as borrowers looking to get money from private money lenders. Awesome guys. Uh, let's see what we got. Annette, appreciate you as well too. Hope. Absolutely. Donna, you're more than welcome. Leon. Absolutely. Helen, Annette. Yeah, absolutely. I will send all that stuff over to you. Just shoot me an email, uh, or, uh, shoot me a text and I will get that um, template over to you immediately. If you want the email template, the best thing to do is email me because I can just super quickly forward that over to you. All right. Here's my phone number guys. Boom. Here is my email. Marilyn, would you like to get, or would like to get with you in little rock sometime? Awesome. Marilyn. Yeah, absolutely. We do a lot of projects in Maryland or in, in little rock. So, um, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, I'm happy to happy to connect. Deontay, can I help you out? You obviously can, you're more than welcome to help us out, man. Uh, we are always looking to take on private money lenders. Um, we're, you know, doing about uh, six to eight deals every single month. So I'm always out there raising private money, looking to add new members to the team um, and support with, with um, you know, investing or, or training. So please, please, yeah, would love to connect. Brady, if you were looking for a $3 million line of credit for eight years for horizontal construction on an entitled subdivision and able to pay up to 20% IRR, where would you look for that type of lender? Man, a lot of, a lot of conditions there, Brady. Um, what I would do is that's going to be subdivision ground up construction is probably some of the riskiest development there is uh, especially in a high interest rate climate but you are offering a very good IRR um, since it is an IRR structure you're likely going to want to syndicate that development project so you know you're going to want to connect with uh, accredited investors who are willing to invest in that type of syndication uh, Lucy, do you seek multiple lenders on the same deal? And if so, how does each lender at first lien position? Lucy, this is a fantastic question. Thank you for asking. Um, I try to only ever do one lender per deal. And the reason why is because that provides the most security to my lender possible. All right. So if I'm, if I'm doing one deal, uh, I want to, um, have one lender who's lending the full amount for the purchase and renovation. And, and our deals vary in terms of costs. I mean, sometimes lenders can be all in for under a hundred grand, you know, in this particular deal, you know, it's just under 300 grand, right? So that provides maximum protection for my individual lender. So great, great question. Joanne, do you ask the borrower what percentage of time did they pay their investor? Do you ever not meet that principle? So I think what you're asking is how long of a loan term. I always do a 12 month loan term, but I always set the expectation that like, for example, it's going to be a 12 month loan term. I have the ability to have this loan out for 12 months, but 
my goal was likely paying it back with inside of four. So that's normally what will happen. Um, I hope that Joanne, that answered, answer your question. All right. What's the best rates you've seen from lenders over the past two years and how are you ever refinancing them out to hold? Uh, Lee. So I usually always pay my lenders 12% on short-term loans, eight to 10% on long-term loans. So for loans that are shorter than 12 months, I will pay 12% loans that are longer than 12 months, which usually wind up being 36 months. I usually pay eight or 10%, usually 10. Uh, but uh, the reason why I do that is I don't really pay attention to the market. I mean, I could lower my rates, increase my rates of the market, but I want my private money lenders to work with me. I know they have other options and places to lend money. So I want them to stay with me. So I'll pay them to stay with me. So that's how I usually structure the debt. Is land lucrative with cash flow and passive income and private lending? Uh, Shraf, I do not know a whole lot about land. I think it's getting popular and popular, more and more popular. Um, that's based on the fact that, you know, there's so much development that needs to go on in this country right now. Um, does that mean that there's stability and value to it? Uh, land's only as valuable as, you know, anything's only as valuable as, as anyone's willing to pay for it, right? Someone's way more willing to pay for a home than they are for a piece of dirt. So I think, you know, I think right now there's some security in investing in land. I think if you turn it quickly, but for me personally, I wouldn't want to be sitting on it. But yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people are making money on it right now. I just don't know a whole lot about it, if I'm being honest. Do you refinance out the loan if you want to keep the house as a rental? I usually do, uh, Lee, but I haven't been recently. Um, normally I'd buy, renovate, and then refinance the home inside of three or four months just because I used to be able to get a super low interest rate, three, four, 5%, right? Now, my, now the interest rates suck, right? So what I normally do is I'll talk to my private money lender and said, say, hey, Mr. Private Money Lender, you know, this is going to be a rental for me. If I put a, a renter in there, even at a 10% interest rate, it's still going to cash flow. Are you cool doing a 36 month loan? You'll be in first lien position. You'll be fully insured. You're going to get, you know, interest paid monthly and your money's going to be a lot. You don't have to worry about turning your money over to another investor. You're just going to keep racking up that 10, 8, 12% interest, right? And then I will hold, I will just pay my private money lender for those three years, waiting for interest rates to start to decline. And once they do decline, then I'll refinance out, pay my private money lender back, recycle their cash. Uh, Leah, yes. Before, before, before. Yes, absolutely. Um, definitely 100% before. Yep. You got it. Brady, I exclusively in land and have hundreds of transactions. It tends to be the first place to fluctuate and doesn't cash flow. The value is more speculative. Boom. Brady, you thank you for bringing a answer to that. Lucy, how do you decide exactly what interest rate to use? Um, as a borrower, I'm willing to pay a fair rate that keeps my um, investors happy. Um, that's, you know, what can I afford and what keeps my investors happy? What I found for loans under 12 months, everybody's happy with 12%. Um, there's stability there. There's good income. You know, there are other investors that are offering more, but my track record allows me to, you know, pay 12 um, and not more. So so that's that's what I've always landed on. I've literally been paying 12% for 15 years, probably. Awesome. Chris, I see you have your hand up. What's up, dude? What do we got? Anyone doing private HELOC loans? Um, Hope, I just saw this in the Q&A. Forgive me. Um, yes, home equity lines of credit are awesome ways to do private money loans. You just play arbitrage, right? You borrow at six, you lend out at 12, you get a six spread. Home equity line of credit is awesome. Um, what interest rate would you have for being second lien? I hardly ever do second liens. I don't ever lend on second liens, but if I borrow second liens, usually 15%. To be sure, is the project proceeds to the lender 12% of the loan? Great question, Jesse. Um, it's 12% per annum. So that means 1% per month. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, if I'm only going to loan you a loan for four months, that doesn't seem like a whole lot of money. Well, I roll that money over, right? So normally we have enough projects to just keep our private money lenders money working. So even though we're just borrowing on one deal for four months, 
you know, a week after that deal closes and you get your money back, you're going to be lending it again as long as you want to, right? So we just keep that money rolling. And then Travis, do you entertain deals like car washes and laundromats? Man, real estate's a beautiful thing. Anything can be a great deal. So feel free to send anything my way, guys. Would you ask a borrower, have they ever defaulted on paying back a private money lender? Absolutely, jo Joanne. That is a more than fair question. Awesome, guys. Looks like we got the end of the question. It has been a freaking blast, guys. Remember, email or text me if you guys have any desire to be a private money lender on this project or something in the future. Or if you want that email template, email me as well. I'm more than happy to share that with you. It's what I send out to all my private money lenders. Guys, it has been awesome. I um, hope that I have the opportunity uh, to come on and work and teach with you guys again in the future. Uh, I guess uh, if you want, give me a great review to Steven, or if you never want to see me again, you can give me a poor review, but I hope it is the former guys. Again, awesome to see you guys here. I uh, hope you have all have a fantastic week. And as always, happy freaking investing. Have a great week. Crush it. See you guys.